In my video on F0X, I said I'm a Sonic fan. As a Sonic fan on YouTube, I am contractually obligated to make a video about a Sonic game. What better way to do that than a video on the first game in the series? And what better way to start said video than with a little history lesson? Way back in the late 80s, Nintendo was the biggest gaming powerhouse. It was a household name. Sega had recently released their Sega Mega Drive, known as the Sega Genesis in America. Sega was fed up with Nintendo. Their Super Mario Bros. franchise cast a huge shadow on every corner of the gaming world that wasn't remotely related to Nintendo. Sega needed a way to compete. And fast. They went to the drawing board and created a whole bunch of concepts for characters to starve for the game that would utilize the Mega Drive's faster processing power compared to other consoles on the market. The character they finally decided on was a hedgehog named Mr. Needlemouse. That was obviously later changed to Sonic the Hedgehog. This character just exudes the totally radical attitude that Sega was pushing in the 90s. This mindset is exemplified in the ad campaign that ran from September of 1990 to December of the same year. Sonic the Hedgehog released in June of 1991 to a resounding success. Sonic became the mascot of Sega, and from that point on, they never made another game with a different intellectual property again. The story of the game is that the evil Dr. Robotnik is using all of the little animals as batteries to power his evil robots called Badniks. Our hero, Sonic the Hedgehog, doesn't like this at all, and being the cool dude he is, goes to save the creatures and kick Robotnik's real butt. This game is a fast-paced 2D platformer. I'm only saying this out of necessity because I don't think there's a single person on Earth who doesn't know that. Sonic himself has two main abilities, and there are several power-ups. These include a shield that makes you invincible, but it goes away when you get hit, super sneakers, which make you run even faster, an extra life, which is self-explanatory, and the star shield, which makes Sonic invincible for a short while, and the rings. The rings are a super unique idea. Instead of coins and a life power-up, Sonic has both in one. When you collect 100, you get an extra life. But if you have at least one, you can't die. You can still get crushed or fall in a pit, but one ring is all you need for protection. When Sonic gets hit, he drops all the rings he's carrying and can recollect up to 20 of them. Now on to his main abilities. He can go through the air and climb up trees. He can jump into or onto bad nicks to destroy them, or perform a spin attack by pressing down on the D-pad while running along the ground. They hadn't invented the spin dash yet, that was introduced in the second game. When Sonic is rolling, he acts like a ball, gaining momentum whenever he goes down a hill. This can be lots of fun to blast through stages. That is when the stages are designed around that mechanic of momentum. Zones like Green Hill, Spring Yard, and Starlight encourage going fast and have lots of ways for you to gain momentum, whether it be from slopes, springs, or maybe in a loop-de-loop. -loop. On the completely opposite side of the spectrum, you have Marble Zone and Labyrinth Zone. These levels are just all about waiting. Just waiting. Maybe there's some platforming here and there, but none of it is fast paced and a lot of it feels very tedious. Marble Zone Act 3 has this part where you have to wait, do some tricky platforming, and if you mess up again, you have to do all the waiting. Labyrinth Zone is a much different beast, which I will get into later. Labyrinth Zone is stupid and I hate it, and if you're gonna type in the comments saying, Oh, I like Labyrinth Zone, it wasn't that bad. Shut up, you're wrong. Just because you can do it easily doesn't mean it's good. I can do this easily. This zone is awful. It goes against everything the player has been taught up to this point. There aren't any slopes at all in this zone, save for a water slide or two, but those don't count because you can't run on them. Which means that you can't gain momentum past Sonic's maximum run speed, which is super slow compared to what we're used to in later games. This is because of a mechanic called the speed cap, which forces Sonic's speed to cap off at a certain amount when you hold in either direction. Of course, in a regular stage, you can go faster by performing a spin attack and or jumping at correct spots and gaining lots of momentum and speed that way. But as previously mentioned, you can't gain any of that extra momentum due to a lack of any sort of slopes to go fast on. And what's worse is the water. Sonic moves incredibly slow in his water and his jump is super floaty. So basically Super Smash Bros. Brawl minus the tripping. Just kidding, Brawl is my favorite one in the series. Anyways, the water works completely against the level design. Time and time again, you will find yourself getting absolutely smacked by these big spiked balls. It's like Soviet Russia. Balls slap you, and you die. Oh, also not to mention you can drown. These four notes have haunted my childhood and they will haunt me to the day I die. By drowning? You can stall Sonic's time limit on living by grabbing air bubbles, but sometimes it seems like you run out of air right before getting a bubble, or a bubble appears right after you're already dead. 
The boss of this zone is also unconventional, but I'll go over all the bosses together later. The next zone, Starlight Zone, is a breath of fresh air. It's another fast-paced zone, like Green Hill and Springyard zones. The music in this zone is also great, but we'll get into my favorite songs later. It's the only zone besides Green Hill to have loops in it. Kinda weird how we all remember Sonic games for the loops, but the first game in the series only has a handful of them. Oh wow, would you look at that? We're in a special zone now. These are used to get the six Chaos Emeralds. They added a sign one later so it would be seven, like the Dragon Balls. And they are not fun at all. This stage spins around and you have to touch these blocks to influence how it spins, and you have to break apart these parts, and don't touch the parts that say goal, and you gotta get a Chaos Emerald. Get what you came for, you know? Anyways, the controls are super wonky and I don't like it. And the good ending is just big boy flowers, so who even cares? Scrap Rain Zone is next and also last. It's tough if you're not a pro at the game like me. <laughs> if you don't already know about all the traps, you will get a game over. It's trial and error, the zone. Oh hey look, it's Labyrinth Zone. Everything here is like the original Labyrinth, but worse. The only good part is that there's a shortcut you can take at the beginning to skip a vast majority of the act. Finally, it's Final Zone. No rings, just boss. It's kinda easy if you know what you're doing. It's not hard to figure out what to do. It just takes a while for the pistons to come up so you can hit it. When you finish the boss, you can choose to let Robotnik live, or murder him. Of course, he doesn't actually die, he's gotta come back for the next game. Speaking of bosses, they're all very hit or miss for me and they all take 8 hits, which makes them more difficult than your typical Mario boss. The classic Wrecking Ball from Green Hill is iconic and it teaches players how to dodge and not suck. Marble Zone's boss is decent. It's easy enough and fits the theme of the level, shooting fire on the ground so you have to jump to the other platform. Spring Yard can be fun. Eggman has a spike on the bottom of his Eggmobile, and when you're under him, he comes down to stab you. He gets lodged in the floor though, and when he finally pulls it out, that segment of the floor breaks. If you're good enough, it goes down in seconds. Just be sure to leave a bridge for you to make it over to the right side of the screen when you're done. Starlight's boss is way too easy. You just have to hit his bombs into himself, or use the bombs like a seesaw and jump into him. I saved Labyrinth Zone for last because I'm going to rant again. Labyrinth Zone's boss follows all the conventions set by the rest of Labyrinth Zone. And of course by that, I mean it breaks every convention set by the rest of the game. The path leading up to this is a vertical shaft with these corks. The water rises and the corks rise with the water. If you fall off here, it might seem like you're screwed, but you have to go to the leftmost side of the basin you landed in. That makes the water lower. This has never been shown in the entire zone, and there's no indication that this is a thing that can happen. When you get up to the boss, Eggman starts flying away. He goes up a vertical shaft, and of course, you're trying to hit him. It's a boss after all, you hit bosses to win. The shaft is full of spears and gargoyle heads that shoot projectiles. This all seems barely manageable at first. Barely, but still manageable. Climb up the dangerous shaft and get 8 hits on the boss. Then the water starts to rise. After 2 or 3 deaths, maybe even a game over, you realize that you can't catch up to Dr. Robotnik. So what do you do? Just try to make it to the top. Even just getting to the top it can be super hard because of the water and the traps. When you finally get to the top, Eggman is there waiting. When I first got to this point, I was expecting a boss fight. Nope, he just flies away. To beat this boss, you don't even have to hit it. Just get to the top of a platforming segment. How anticlimactic. Now onto my favorite part about the game, the presentation. Let's talk about the visual aesthetic. The visuals are very stylish and geometric. It's kind of surreal in a way. The polygonal trees and checkered ground in Green Hill is a great example of this. All zones have a nice color palette too. Green Hill is probably the most vibrant, with its bright greens, deep blues, and tasteful browns. Some of my favorites are Starlight, a green and gray road against a starry night sky with a city in the background. Scrapper in Act 1 also looks really good with its metallic blue level geometry and its dark yellow background with factors that spew smog. Most stages have a good amount of contrasting colors to make them pop from the last one. The one exception to this rule, of course, is Labyrinth Zone. Can you tell I like the rag on this zone? It's all yellow. All of it. The foreground is yellow with some facial carvings in the limestone, and the background is the exact same but bigger and darker. All the levels in this game have a really cool continuous theme of nature versus machine. You go from Green Hill Zone to Marble Zone, which was originally going to be Labyrinth, that's why it's shown this way on the stage select. Thank god they didn't toss you into the deep end right away. To Spring Yard, to Labyrinth, Starlight, and finally Scrap Brain. 
I think this theming is really cool and fits the story of the animal fight scientist. Unfortunately, it was kind of dropped in later games. On to the music. None of this is bad. Even Labyrinth Zone is good. The soundtrack was composed by Masato Nakamura, the bassist and songwriter of the J-pop band Dreams Come True. Instead of telling you about all the best tracks, let me play a few of my favorites. So that's Sonic the Hedgehog, a good game that has a few bad parts, those being Marble Zone and Labyrinth Zone. I like this game, but the sequels are all better. I might make videos on them, who knows. <laughs> 